So I pray you to speak through me, and then you just reach their hearts and convict, convict each and every one of us in the areas where we need to learn to be more honest and to be more honoring to you. Thank you. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so um, there's a lot of verses that I didn't put in here, but if you read the chapter, I would highly encourage you to write those down and then to use them for later. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you guys a homework assignment. Um, there's about four or five verses, uh, sections of verses I'm going to give you that are from the uh, Marriage 911 workbook. So uh, this is a homework assignment that I would give a mentee that's going through this with me um, to study as they go throughout their materials that week. And it's a really good section of verses that really challenge us to look at how God views honesty. All right, so the first verse is from Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then in Colossians 3, 9, do not lie to one another. So as the title says, it's very specifically about the little things that we do and say that are dishonest, or sometimes maybe they're not little and they're just very obvious and they're dishonest. And um, kind of trying to face those and figure out how those can play in a marriage and damage a marriage. So um, as it says here, is lying for any reason always a sin in God's eyes? Or is there ever a time where we can lie? Like a good reason. Like if it's good enough, we can do it. If your life depended on it, would God be okay with you lying? What do you guys think? I see some heads shaking. Anybody think it's okay in, every, in any circumstance to lie? What do you think? How many of you guys have lied? How many of you guys have lied to your spouse? I see a lot less hands going up. I think some of you are lying right now, I'm just saying. I know for a fact I have lied to my spouse many times, and most of the many times are little white lies, as this chapter talks about, where you'll, you'll say something, and sometimes it's so offhand, so like innocent in our minds that we don't even think twice about it. We just do it. Um, like I was talking with Rod earlier, and these are the, what I call the dangerous little white lies. But um, you've always heard, like, uh, I'll use Jeff Fox for these silly jokes. Do these pants make me look seductive? Right? <laughs> On the, on the twisted side, it usually, usually have it in media and in movies where the female will say, do these pants make me look fat? Does this dress look good on me? What do you think of my hair, dear? Did you even notice? Right? And so there's those little white lies that as a husband, for me, I would be like, well, you know, how do I answer that and be honest and not hurtful? Or how do I answer that so that she knows I'm being honest, but she accepts the honesty? And so there's two sides to that little white lie, right? Sometimes we want to uh, furnish what we say so it sounds a little better and it's still the truth, but there's a vein of dishonesty. We're like, oh, that's okay. We're just trying to make sure that things are kosher and no one's upset. But those are still little white lies. So it's a dangerous game to play. So um, I'm going to go right into the book. It's on page 112. There's just a little bit of a patch here I want to read to you guys. <clears throat> A husband who lies to his wife is saying through his actions, you don't deserve the truth. I don't love you. A wife who lies to her husband is saying through her actions, I don't trust your ability to handle the truth, and I don't respect you. And I the first time I read that, that was kind of like, you know, it seemed a little bit extreme. But at the same time, if you, ever, if you go back to chapter 4 where we identify secret motives, um, one of the things you want to challenge yourself to do when you do little white lies or big ones sometimes is what was your motive behind that lie or that little bit of dishonesty? Was it to protect the person you're lying to? Was it to avoid some kind of trouble? So maybe um, the lie, if it's just directed to your spouse, maybe you hung out with your friends too long or do something and you're trying to make a good excuse for why you were out so long. So you do a little bit of a white lie to make it sound better. Um, maybe uh, you're just lying because you like it or because you grew up lying so much that you don't know how to stop. Um, I have a sibling who does that. That's his issue. One of his great sins in his life is that he is a pathological liar. And so for him, he will just say stuff without even thinking that's a lie. And sometimes he doesn't even know he's doing it. That's how bad it's gotten for him. And so some people, that they're just raised that way or grew up that way based on circumstances. 
And then the fourth reason you might be lying is to control somebody or to control a result or a circumstance. So they're all really um, big issues that we have to face, but I would argue that most of the time, the little white lies that we do are from uh, a heart of wanting to protect somebody or to try to avoid some kind of basic trouble. And sometimes it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't seem like a big deal. And at the time, like, well, you know, if I do the little white lie, I avoid the bigger uh, consequence of if I told the truth. So you're like, you don't want to fight with your spouse and they ask you what they look like and you don't like it, but you want to hurt their feelings, so you lie. Well, that looks great, right? And then they don't have their feelings hurt and everybody's happy, right? Well, the problem is that wasn't true. And so now you're, now you're losing some of that respect from your spouse by not being honest with them. Now, there, as we discover it, towards the end, um, the delicate dance of tasteful transparency at the end, we discuss exactly how we should be telling the truth, not just, you know, if, if your spouse asks you, as an example, do these pants make me look fat, don't go, yes, dear. That's probably not the best way to approach that truth, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a, a line between telling the truth to somebody and then being a flat-out liar. So it's, we're going to go over that a lot tonight and model what that looks like. So um, one of the things I wrote down here as a note, just to read to you guys, is high risk equals high intimacy, and low risk equals low intimacy. And so that's going to be in regard to telling the truth to your spouse. Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of truth it is. Uh, if you are willing to risk something to tell the truth, like maybe there's going to be some discomfort in the conversation, maybe your spouse will be upset with you for a while because of that truth you told them. But if you're willing to risk that, what that creates over time is a special intimacy with your spouse. So it creates a very high intimacy with your spouse because they know you're telling the truth. They know they can trust that what you say is meaningful. But the drawback to that is if you aren't willing to tell the truth, if you're, in other words, taking low risks and not saying those things that you need to say, then the intimacy is also not going to be very good. So it's kind of a, it's a balanced thing. If you're willing to be honest and truth with your spouse in a loving and kind way, that can result in a lot of intimacy that you might not have experienced before. Now, to clarify, uh, if you're not experiencing a whole lot of intimacy with your spouse right now, don't automatically assume that they're lying about something. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. But if you know in, in, in your own heart that that's what's going on for you, like you're being dishonest in different ways, maybe you should consider how you can approach your spouse with those things and start bringing those to light. All right, so in the next section, there's a lot of examples of mod modeling dishonesty in the home. And the reason I have this list here, even though it's from the book, is I just wanted to draw to our attention the very simple ways that we regularly lie as people. And um, as a teacher, I've seen like two-thirds of these <laughs> happen from parents and their kids. Um, I know I personally have done some of these myself. And um, so I, I think most of us are very guilty in some form or another for some of these on the list. So hopefully some of these will ring true in the sense that you know you've done them and you understand why someone might want to. So lying to your children for any reason. Uh, one of my great issues that I have and my wife regularly challenges me on is I, I am highly sarcastic with my kids. So um, I'll say something like, oh, let my son like, are we going to talk about like, you bet we are in a very sarcastic way, which they don't understand. So they're like, oh, we're going to Taco Bell. Well, to my kid, I just lied, if we're not, right? To me, I'm like, well, I'm joking. And my wife's like, no, that's not joking to them. And that's where I stop and have to think, oh, she's, she's right. I'm actually lying to my son right now, and what is that teaching him? And so lying to our children for any reason is something we've got to watch for, we have to guard against. And a lot of times, especially with guys, we'll look at that and say, that's not a big deal, though. It's just a joke. But is it? Are we being straight out dishonest, or are we actually joking? Do you guys see that little fine line there? And how that can get kind of uncomfortable, especially for us guys. Giving a false address so your child can attend a specific school. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys remember this, and some of you guys in here are parents right now, so maybe you ex have experienced it. But just a few years ago, uh, most like school district rezoned everything to, uh, to work in uh, Endeavor Middle School. And this was a huge issue. We were having kids left and right come into Endeavor that had uh, addresses from their grandma, their cousins, their aunts, and just so they could go to that school. And then vice versa, they'd go to a different school. They'd put the address of someone in their family that lived in the Chief Mo region or the, the Frontier region. And um, it was a constant issue at the face to balance numbers. So um, it seems like a silly one, but it happens more often than you'd think. 
telling someone that answered the phone to say, you aren't there when you are. Now, in today's world, this is, you got to remember this was written in 2007 when cell phones weren't quite as popular yet, but, um, and we still had this thing called a landline. But uh, if, you're, if you're honest about it, you think about it, uh, those of you guys probably had parents that did it, right? Or maybe you did it yourself at some point, if you're, if you're old enough, where you said, hey, don't tell them I'm here, you know, when you are there, right? And that's, that's definitely a dishonest. Protecting your child against a deserved punishment or consequence from someone by lying or covering for them. And uh, one of my favorite stories from my childhood was my older brother had done something wrong in school, and um, my dad protected him a little bit. You know, he, he thought my, son was tell- my brother was telling the truth, and um, come to find out he wasn't. And one of the coolest things, and I didn't think about it, it was at the time because I didn't want my brother to get in trouble, but what was really cool was my dad just threw him under the bus. Once he realized he was telling, he was telling a lie, that was it. He, he said, he told the school, give him everything you want to give him for a punishment. And my, my brother was like, Dad, I thought you loved me. And he goes, that's why I'm doing it. And at the time, we're both like, what the heck? Why would my dad want me to get in trouble and get hurt? And uh, that was the exact reason. He was trying to teach us why it's important to be honest and why it's important to do the right thing no matter what. And um, that was a good lesson for us to learn. Uh, in the beginning of it, we were terrified. We're like, oh, great. Now we know our dad's never going to protect us and defend us, so we better be careful. But that was the beauty of it, was it taught us to take our roles as students in that school seriously and to be more honest about what we were doing and not think that our dad would just get us off. And Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, and, you know, what's worse now is you'll get telemarketer calls. So you'll look on your cell phone and see this funky number. I'm like, fine, answering that. And that's a simple way to deal with it. You're not being dishonest by not answering. I tend to like to answer it and just shut them up. You know, like, I'm, you know, if it's a mortgage thing, oh, you want to renew your mortgage? Nope. Why not? Nope. Click. <laughs> you know, just... Right. Yeah, see, there you go. So it, it's so easy to fall into the trap of, of being silly. And there was one time, and it was hilarious at the time, but uh, I answered the phone, I just started speaking full Spanish. And boy, that got hung up quick. He's like, nope, I'm not going to deal with this guy. And, um, and then I thought about it later, I'm like, I, I, that was a pretty good lie, you know? And it was funny, and someone was like, well, that's innocent. No, no, it's not. I just told someone that I was a Spanish speaker that I couldn't understand English, and you know, I mean, the guy has a job to do, and I could have just been polite and said, I'm sorry, I don't need your business. Um, and it's, it's a difficult thing to do, or you could just be like my wife and just don't answer the darn phone. <laughs> so uh, telling your spouse or kids that you are upset with someone, yet not being honest and forthright with the actual person. So um, this is uh, one of the things that Paul talks about quite a bit um, to some of the new churches, right? And if you read the New Testament... You'll hear him constantly addressing this type of thing, the whole gossip idea, the whole backbiting, and this person's better than that person, and this gospel's better than that gospel, and so on and so forth. And, um, and that's pretty much exactly what this is, is you have, whether you're talking to your spouse, your kids, your best friend, you're talking behind someone's back because you're not brave enough or uh, honoring enough to just go to the person and say, this is the problem I have. And it's a very easy thing to do. I think we've all done it at some point. You come home from work, you're upset with what happened at work, and so you tell your spouse how bad it was, right? I think almost any one of us in here can say we've done that. And sometimes it's harmless, but then there's that point where if you're not willing to face the issue with that person and reconcile, now you're gossiping. You guys see the difference there and how that can become a dishonest act where you're, you're just bashing that person behind their back but not willing to go into them and say, this is an issue we need to work out. And specifically, this can be in regard to your spouse, so maybe you're hanging out with your friends, and you're like, oh, would you believe what my wife just did today? Oh, blah, 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 blah. And so going to your spouse and saying, hey, you know, that was hard what happened, and I didn't like that, and then facing it. And when we go back to chapter 6, and we talk about how to deal with anger appropriately, that comes into play in full force with how do you approach your spouse when you are angry or when they're angry to address an issue that needs to be addressed. And then uh, this is my favorite, because I've done this more times than I care to admit, calling in sick when you're not. Now, as a teacher, I get a lot of sick days. And uh, one of the, the running jokes in the school district with teachers is um, they're not sick days. They're mental health days. And I always thought about that, how, um, you know, 
which in some cases I feel can be kind of true. Sometimes you're just so set, so stressed out that you just need to take a day. And, you know, and if that's the honest truth, that's great. You know, take the day, take a breather, get out, get out of the situation. But if you're taking a day off to go golfing with your buddies or to go to an amusement park or to go on vacation early, are you really sick anymore? Do you really need that day off? Right? That's where that dishonesty can come in. So you got to watch that line. And, and really what it comes down to, as we say later, and I'll say it throughout this session, is, is the thing you're saying and or doing honoring God. So if you're not sure about the honesty of what you're saying or you're doing, give it to God. Ask him. I can guarantee you within, within minutes, he's going to convict you or not about what's going on and what you're saying and what you're doing. So, um, but most of the time, we, we already know before we even pray about it, right? We know that what we were thinking or doing wasn't kosher, wasn't a, a truth. Um, this next one I thought was interesting because I don't think it's as much of a problem anymore, but changing price tags to get something cheaper. In other words, stealing, right? Now, what I have heard happening, which I didn't even think of, and I wish I never did because it's, you know, it's almost tempting, is um, there's this new scam that people will do at Walmart. You know, you get that self-checkout where you can scan a box of something and then put another thing that you didn't scan into the bag instead of that thing. And so you could scan one box that let's say is five bucks and the thing you're putting in the bag is 20, right? And just keep scanning and doing that. You can, you can get away with a lot of stuff. And apparently there's a lot of people doing that. I'm like, dang, that's brave. But I think in this context, they're talking about those literal like little paper tags, something that's like 2.99 and you switch it off and put it on something that's 200, you know, and then you go to the checkout and like, well, that's weird, that's so cheap, okay. And you get it for 2.99. You think, oh, no big deal, I gave him money, right? Well, that's a pretty big deal. You're still stealing. If you get caught, you're going to jail. So um, little things like that. Giving a false reason to not go to church, uh-oh, or a meeting or a get-together. So I know we've all done that at least once, where you feign something to get out of a something, right? So it could be your, your friends, your best friends ask you to come over and you're too tired. So you're like, well, I'm busy. I got to get this stuff done for Monday when you just don't want to go. And you don't want to hurt their feelings and make them think you don't want to be with them, right? Or church is the famous one. I've, I've had many times where uh, I've invited people to come and they're like, oh, I'd love to come. And then the day comes around and they don't show and ask them why. And like, oh, well, you know, I just, something came up. And one time I had a friend who needed a ride to go to church. And so I went to go pick him up and he literally wouldn't even come to the door. And then a few hours later, he said, oh, I slept in. And uh, he, while he was saying he slept in, he was on Facebook posting things. I'm like, dude, dude, at least try to hide your dishonesty a little bit, make you feel a little better. So um, it's really important that we're being honest about the reasons that we do things, and then reminding ourselves that, that what we're doing is really supposed to be for the God we serve. So are we honoring God in those things that we're doing? So if we're not going to church, why aren't we? Is the reason we're not going honoring God? So maybe you're throwing up. Yeah, probably don't go to church for that. But if you're like, oh, I just don't feel like going to church today. Oh, that's not a good enough reason to just say I'm not going. Like we need to, we need to be honest about the reasons that we're skipping out on, on things, activities, or gatherings that we should be going to. And then this last one's a little bit more serious. Lying to authorities or to schools to protect someone in the family from a consequence. Now, this one can get really tricky because sometimes that lie can save someone from jail time or whatever, and it could have just been a fluke, the situation that you're in or that person is in. Um, but the reality is if they, if they deserve that thing that's coming to them and we protect them from that, are they going to learn from that thing they did? Right. So in last week's session, there was that story with the husband and wife. The husband was a pastor, and it was something like 20 years where he was abusive to his wife. And she hid it from the church the entire time. 20 years passes, some final straw event happened. She calls the police, he gets arrested, uh, ultimately resigns from the church, and then divorces her. And uh, we can't know, you know, looking, looking back, if she had been honest about that in the beginning, if that would have fixed the issue. What we do know is that her dishonesty um, led to him never improving and their lives being miserable, right, due to that, that abuse that they were going through. So it's really important that when something is going on in our relationships, specifically with our spouses, that we're willing to be honest about those things. Now, like I said, this is obviously not an exhaustive list, but I think there are some things on this list that each and every one of us in here has done at least once. 
And um, as the Ten Commandments talk about, you know, that we're not supposed to lie, like, at all. And each and every one of us in here has done it at least once. So, living in the light, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And um, I really like that verse because it points out the exact thing that we're all facing in this room, which is um, Satan's machinations. So um, the whole idea of lying is, is just so well known to him. That's, that's who he is. That's what he is. That's what that's meant by his own character. Whereas if we look on the opposite end, um, so Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth he's talking about is literally himself. He is truth. So when you, you see this oppositeness where Satan is the complete uh, ideation of lying, and Jesus is the opposite. He's the complete image of truth. And there's a definite clash. So if we're to claim uh, we're followers of Jesus um, and that he is the father that we serve, then we need to be exhuming that truth. Whereas if we're lying then we're saying at that point that we're serving the other father, which is Satan. And that's not a place we want to be in. And so um, it's really important that these, these stories that uh, we hear, that, uh, they may be extreme for some of us, but that we hear how that lie, that dishonesty can damage a relationship, a marriage, or a family. So um, in Michelle's story about Alicia, as it says here in pages 117 through 119, it's a bit of a read but it's important that I go over it again just to kind of show you the power of the lie and then also the power of the truth on the other end of it. So this story, if you, how many of you guys, again, read this chapter this week? Okay, so some of you guys already know this story. The rest of you guys, this will be uh, a new thing. Um, it's just, just really listen to Michelle's heart and the reasons that she lied in the beginning and then the reasons that she told the truth in the end and then uh, how God honored that. All right, so... Um, as a child, I loved reading romance fairy tales and believed that finding the right prince and having a dream wedding would guarantee my happiness. Unfortunately, when I married in 1965, I didn't have a dream wedding. I married my high school boyfriend at the age of 17, and I lied when I told him he was the father of the child I was carrying. When Alicia was born, John was in Vietnam. I thought about telling him the truth when he returned from the war, but decided against it. As a result, there was an emotional wall between us that continued to grow, even after giving birth to our own daughter, Melissa, two years later. Instead of being honest with John and working on the issues in our marriage, I falsely believed it was best to keep the truth buried. When he said he wanted a trial separation so he could sow some wild oats, I responded by filing for a divorce. I started dating immediately and remarried as soon as my divorce from John was final in 1970. When Heather was born, Within the first year, my new marriage was already in crisis. Ken, Ken said he loved me, but wasn't sure if he wanted to stay married. His lack of commitment, combined with my insecurities, led to our separation soon after Heather's birth. During this time, my first husband, John, had repented of his oat sowing and wanted to reconcile. Not wanting to be alone, I remarried him when my divorce with Ken was final. It was soon after John's and my remarriage in 1973 that I attended the week-long Christian crusade and was baptized. When John and I relocated to Alaska a couple of weeks later, I never got involved in a church. Sadly, I continued to hide the truth from my first pregnancy. About, and shortly after our remarriage, many of the same problems John and I had the first time around haunted us once again. We divorced for a second time just two years later in 1975. I didn't realize the loneliness in my heart could have been filled with Jesus' love. Instead, I turned away from God's love and sought out man's love, marrying again within two years. This time, the results were even more damaging. The man I married was controlling and abusive in many ways. Although I didn't attend a church, I began to pray and read the Bible alone in the evenings, searching for answers that would help me make lasting changes in my life. So if you're not keeping track, this is now her fourth marriage in 10 years. One of the initial changes I made was to finally disclose the truth about my first pregnancy. 
Alicia was almost a teenager by then, and I was able to locate her biological father, Steve, living in the state of Washington. When I called and told Steve the truth, his reply was a welcome relief. Michelle, I always knew Alicia was my daughter. You have just restored my faith in women. He said he was happy to finally have her in his life again. Steve and Alicia connected by writing letters until they were able to meet face to face a year later. I believe God blessed my desire to be honest about Alicia's biological father because everyone in our families, including Steve's extended family members and my other two daughters and their fathers, accepted the truth amazingly well. There has never been a moment that I regretted telling everyone the truth. In fact, Alicia recently turned 40, and the whole family threw a surprise birthday party for her. When it was time for the guests to go up to the microphone and give Alicia a birthday blessing, Steve, her biological father, was one of the first people to come forward. With tears in his eyes, he said, Alicia, you are so special to me, and I am grateful you have given me four precious grandchildren. They are the highlight of my life. As Steve spoke, I couldn't help thinking about how different Alicia and Steve's lives would have been had I not come forward with the truth. Not only would Alicia have been robbed of knowing her father, grandfather, and other family members, but Steve would have missed out being a grandparent to Alicia and Joey's four children. Prior to disclosing the truth, Satan had convinced me that being honest about my pregnancy would not only cause everyone involved pain and heartache, instead, the opposite proved to be true. Hiding the truth destroyed two marriages and created guilt that hovered over me like a dark cloud, waiting to dampen any chance of living a life worthy of happiness. Exposing the lie lifted the cloud, and God was able to take what Satan meant as harm and transform it into many blessings, including the ones that would be carried into my relationship with Joe. Alicia's 40th birthday, a birthday party, was celebrated with everyone who loved her, and I felt blessed to see how far Joe and I had come over the years as he warmly embraced the attendance of both Elise's biological father, Steve, and my first husband, John. So you can see there's a lot of heartache and, and things that happen with this story with Michelle. So in her first marriage, she had already been pregnant from a different man and didn't want to tell him the, the truth. It ruined their marriage. They got divorced. She gets remarried. Lots of lies involved in that one. They get divorced, remarried to the same husband again. Same story, same lies, same destruction. And um, sometimes the lies aren't that serious, but it doesn't matter how small the lie is. I don't think any spouse looks at that and says, yeah, I, I'm so glad, sweetie, that you lied to me about that, whatever that thing may be. And ultimately speaking, if we look back on those lies, they always hurt. They always help us to uh, lose trust in each other. And then ultimately, Satan wins. And if you remember how I started all of these sessions, I reminded everybody here that our marriages are designed and, and made to be gospel, gospel representations. Um, if we're serving the Lord and we're honoring the Lord, our marriages will be that gospel representation to the world, that example of what it's going to look like with uh, the bride and Jesus at the end. And if we're not honoring the Lord, then it does the exact opposite. It tears people away. It's really hard to share the gospel with people when your marriage is in crumbles and um, you're trying to explain to them how good God is, and they're like, well, but, but you guys are not, you don't even have it together. I thought God could fix everything, right? And they're going to look at those examples, those struggles that you have, and be like, why? You know, if God is so good, why isn't he helping you? What's going on? They're going to wonder, right? And that's not to say that our lives have to be perfect for us to share the gospel. But what that is saying is that if our marriages are broken and we're not trusting the Lord, it's going to be that much more hard to get someone to believe that they should. So that's where the, the struggle is going to come in. We want to make sure we're honoring the Lord, uh, first and foremost, just for him in our marriages. And then secondly, so that uh, we are loving our spouse as well, as an example to the world that we are different because God saved us. And so it's really important that these lies that we think about. And um, this, like I said, this can be kind of a hard topic to go over just because of the heaviness of what lies do. And a lot of us in here, I would argue, probably don't lie very often. And, um, and so we're thinking, well, you know, I don't really struggle with this. So let's just kind of get this going, dude. And, um, but the reality is we all struggle with this in some form. And so I would challenge each and every one of you in here to pray about where you may have been dishonest in the past and how you can rectify that. Um, it's surprising how many people we harm with our lies, even if they're small ones, and then how that can have a uh, 
snowball effect on, on situations for people. So that being said, um, in Romans 8.28, there's a really good verse about this here. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So in Michelle's case, uh, she finally gave in and said, all right, God, I'm, I'm going to do what you ask. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to tell the truth. And it ended in a glorious way. Now, that's not to say that you telling the truth in a situation like that is going to end as well for you. We always have to remember that there is a consequence to a sin that we perform, and that uh, rarely will God protect us from the consequence. So there is, there is that piece that we have to face where, as the next section says, truth will have consequences. So um, for Michelle, though, I think everybody involved saw that she was trying to honor that situation, and it did end really well, and God blessed her faithfulness in doing so. So um, in the next section, uh, there's five questions that are designed to help us choose truth. This is from page 120. Um, the first one is, am I trying to play God in this situation? So maybe you're not sure if you're being dishonest. Maybe you're not sure if, if one of those four characteristics of uh, protecting others, avoiding trouble, just lying as you can, or controlling. Um, maybe you're not sure if that's what you're doing. So you could just ask that question. Am I trying to play God in the situation I'm in? So if you're arguing with your spouse and you're trying to get the results you want, um, are you trying to throw that out there? So um, in chapter 27 of Genesis, we probably all know the story really well, uh, Rebecca and Jacob devise a devious plan to uh, usurp Esau's uh, birthright. And they go through that process and it works. Um, but as a result of that dishonesty, Rebecca never sees her son again. Now, um, that's not directly written in the pages that she never sees her son again, but when you look at the story of how he has to leave to serve Laban and, uh, and get those, his, ultimately get his two wives and then come back, by the time he comes back, his mom's already dead. And so um, their plan ultimately backfires on her in that way. So uh, who knows how that would have worked out if they just trusted God to act and how he was going to act. But what we do know is that that was a pretty devious plan that ruined two separate lives um, for a time. And uh, it's really important that we don't step in and say, all right, God, I'm going to take control of the situation. I'm going to get the result that I want. And uh, so if that's what you're trying to do, you might want to give that situation back to God and pray for what he wants. Number two is, is my dishonest behavior getting in the way of a valuable lesson from God? So um, again, this goes back to that, uh, that uh, lying to authorities or uh, calling in sick when you aren't and so on. Um, there's going to be an aspect of trying to protect yourself or somebody that you love from a discipline, from a consequence, and the lie that you do will, will do that. will keep your kid out of getting a referral or getting suspended or um, in the school setting. If you lie about attendance and why you're gone, then you don't have to face the, the Becca court, which can remove credits and all those kinds of scary things. And so there's a lot of times parents will lie about that just to keep, keep their kids in school and get the credits they need so they can graduate on time. But the reality is, as this verse here in Hebrews 12 says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And if you go back into the Old Testament, um, sp do not spare the rod of the child, right? The idea there is that we are supposed to be disciplining our children and teaching them the way so that as they grow up into being adults, when more serious things occur, um, we don't have to stress that they're going to do the wrong thing. Um, and I was just having a conversation with my youngest son today. Um, I'm not sure you guys heard the story or not, but there was a woman today that just died in a Freda who got hit by a vehicle um, walking across the street. And um, I don't know the specific reasons as to how that happened, if she wasn't paying attention, the car wasn't paying attention, or both. But one of the things that I've been telling my boys lately, you know, there's these things that you always tell your kids to keep them safe. And your kids, and you guys remember when you were kids, your kids always think, well, that doesn't really matter. It's not going to happen to me. I don't need to worry about that. But one of the things I've always told my boys, we'll let them check the mail, which is across the street. So you check the, you look both ways every time. Because in our road, cars just beat down that street. And there's no way they're going to stop in time if my son steps in the road and doesn't pay attention. So I'm always telling them, check both ways, check both ways. And they don't fully understand the reasons why. Well, today was a good example of me being able to tell them, this is exactly why, because this could happen. And that's exactly why God tells us what God tells us. He knows that the sins that we will do will lead to terrible consequences. And so he's trying to save us from that. He's not making up laws because he wants to be in control. 
He's giving us those commandments because he wants to protect us and preserve us and see us live healthy, long, fruitful, God-honoring lives. And likewise, being dishonest or having dishonest behavior um, to avoid a consequence also removes the lesson that God's trying to teach you. So it's really important that when you look at these things in that way, that you can stop and ask yourself, what am I supposed to be learning in this situation versus what I'm trying to avoid? And no one wants to be in trouble. No one wants people to see a sin um, that might be you know, embarrassing. But in opening up to that, um, you can free yourself of those issues. So as an example, um, Dave talks about it a lot, you know, how you know, a lot of guys in the church struggle with pornography. If we're hiding from that, if we're not allowing that to come to light and exposing that to uh, some trustworthy man that can hold us accountable, um, we are missing so much of what God can do for us. And um, you've probably heard it said before where, you know, if you sin enough or whatever, you know, you lose the Holy Spirit. Um, I definitely don't think that's true. But what I do think is happening is our sin hides us from the Holy Spirit. So in other words, he's still there waiting for us to come back to him saying, I'm here. I'll give you my strength and my power to defeat this. But we have to be willing to turn around and say, okay, I'm here. And I'm going to give it to you. A lot of times our sin is us saying to the Holy Spirit, I don't need you. I'm going to walk away from you so I can do this. And the Spirit goes, all right, but I'm here. And so uh, being willing to let that lesson hit you in the face and be accountable to somebody can be a powerful way to defeat those dishonest behaviors. Uh, do I fear the reaction of people instead of fearing or revering God? So I kind of just hammered that one out before. But nevertheless, may many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So um, in short, they weren't willing to say, I love you, Jesus, enough to say it publicly because they were afraid that they'd be removed from the synagogue and from the public eye and from what people would think. And uh, if you read the New Testament enough, you can definitely see the, the heat that the Pharisees put on people who believe in Jesus. So it's not necessarily an easy thing. I can almost understand why someone might want to hide that. But at the same time, um, we're definitely being dishonest about that, and we're missing out on something that God wants for us. So the question again is, do you fear the reaction of people more than fearing or revering what God has for you? And then number four is probably the hardest one for all of us. Who are you when no one is looking so this is in the, in the darkness of the night when you're in your own thoughts or maybe you're arguing with your spouse and you're being extra cruel, but no one can see it. And so this can be a really challenging one because this is where our true colors do come out. And this is why our spouses are truly our sacred mirrors because they're the ones that will see everything outside of God. They're the only ones that will see everything. They'll see who you are in your darkest and in your brightest. Um, when we're at church, we're, den we're generally pretty shiny, right? We, we come to church, we're clean, we smell good, we have nice clothes on, we smile. We say, how are you? Oh, you're great, that's good. I am too. And a lot of times there's a darkness in us where we're hurting. We don't want to be honest about it. We want to bring it out to light. And uh, so who are you when no one's looking? Because that's the real you. And, and uh, that can be a pretty convicting thing for some of us when we get home and we're just being jerks to our spouses. And then we come out and we're super sweet to them in public. Or it could be jerks to your kids and yelling them at home, and then you're out in public and you're loving on them like they're the greatest. So who are you when you're at home? That's a really important thing to think about. So for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So just really dwell on that. You know, that could be something you can pray about and say, God, is there areas in my life is there areas when I'm at home when no one sees that I am uh, being dishonest or that I'm hiding from other people that I need to bring to the light, that I need to be accountable for? And this goes right back to chapter 2 with your support system. Uh, nine times out of ten, uh, we're, we're mean and cruel to our family and our, our kids, our spouses, whoever, because there's no one challenging us not to be. So having that support partner, that accountability partner, can be the way that allows you out of those behaviors. Sometimes they're almost impossible to defeat, and unless you have someone that's challenging you otherwise. So if you don't already have 
a friend, a mentor, somebody that is godly that can say, that wasn't okay, dude. Um, you need to find somebody. That's super crucial. And even if you're in a good place right now, that's sometimes the best time to find somebody because then you can build that relationship so that when things do go south, that person's already there for you and ready for you. So is this situation I'm facing right now a result of a previous deception? So uh, I know for me personally, I went into my marriage with Kenza with a lot of past issues that had nothing to do with Kenza, nothing to do with our marriage, and those bled into the marriage. Um, some, some of those were based on deception, some of those were just based on terrible circumstances, but there's a lot of things that played into that that I had to get over, and it was a challenge. And uh, a lot of times it was my wife telling me um, those things I need to work on. Sometimes it was through arguments. Sometimes it was just her just being kind and nice and just telling me. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I had to work on that were previous to the marriage. So that's something to consider too. Sometimes you're in a marriage crisis that has nothing to do with your marriage, which sounds kind of weird to say that. But a lot of times the crises that are caused in our marriage are outside of them. They're from the past. They're from finances, from a job, from uh, something to do with a family member maybe. But the reality is those bleed into the marriage through those deceptions, through those issues, and something that you need to face and not hide from. So we get down to the end here. Are little white lies ever acceptable? I kind of started with that. So I'm hoping it's pretty clear at this point, right? Are little white lies ever acceptable? Okay. So the number one reason for being honest, again, the number one reason for being honest is to honor God, first and foremost. We need to honor God with our truth because that is who he is and that's what he expects from us. We can't be effective representatives of God's people or God's great gospel if there's deception going on in our lives. So for all who do such things, all who act dishonestly are an abomination to the Lord your God. And that's from the Old Testament. So in that section, um, they're specifically talking about weights and measures. So they talk about if you had a, a measuring thing for measuring wheat and then something for grain, um, it needs to be the same measure all the way through. Uh, apparently at the time, there were people making slightly different measures that would give out less than was supposed to be given out. And they'd say, oh, this is, so as an example, if you're giving out a cup of grain, the thing might say cup on it, but it's really only two-thirds of a cup. And so that's kind of what they're talking about in that situation. So it finishes with, all who act dishonestly are an abomination to the Lord your God. So in that section, if you read it that way, you'd almost look at that and go, well, that's not really that big a deal. Like, it's not like they're lying about killing somebody or something. But that's the point, though, is that God is full truth, and he expects us as representatives of him to be the same. And then uh, if you believe you have to lie to your spouse in order to have a good marriage, then you have believed a lie yourself. So it goes right back to um, sometimes those, those innocent little white lies of, you know, does this, these pants make me look fat? Or um, why are we short this month in our finances? Or you can fill in the blank, right? There are all these little things that you could say, well, this is why. Uh, why were you home late from work today? Oh, I just had to work a little longer when the reality was you're hanging out with your friends. You know, something like that. And so just remember that it doesn't matter what kind of lie it is. Um, if you're acting dishonestly to the Lord, that's an abomination. It's pretty intense. All right, so the delicate dance of tasteful transparency. So we've come full circle with these are the reasons you don't lie to if you need to tell your spouse something, that you were lying about or that you want, just want to be honest about without hurting their feelings, how do you do it? So we start with the verse from Proverbs 11, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So in other words, always be honest, always be just in how you say things and do things. So the first step is to proceed with caution and prayer before telling anyone a truth or a secret that you wouldn't want others to know or has been previously disclosed. Now, the underlying thing with this one that I would say is probably the more important thing to say is if there's something you need to tell somebody to get that truth out into the open, you have to be wise about who you tell it. Don't come up to the podium like I am right now and say, would you believe what's going on in my marriage right now? My spouse just cheated on me, and my kid just ran away, and... You know, and tell the whole church and the whole world actually everything's going on and dishonoring your, your family in that way. You got to be very cautious about who you tell and how you tell it. Um, it's, it's a terrible thing to be so truthful to everybody that you end up damaging the person that you're being truthful about. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? 
Um, there's a story in the book about how this lady goes to a women's retreat and tells like 120 ladies, my husband's cheating on me. Oh, and by the way, don't tell anybody. And they're all like, what? You know, 120 ladies from the same church that just found out, oh my gosh, would you believe? So, and trying to tell someone not to tell somebody that, that's hard. Um, even for people who are honest. So um, you really need to be wise about how you tell people things. That's where that support system comes right back into play. If you need to tell someone a truth that is a damaging truth, in other words, something that when it comes out to the light will cause some kind of pain as a result, um, you need to be wise about it. And a support system is perfect for that. You can have a prayer and say, hey, there's a thing I need to say to somebody. Will you pray about that? And then you can go to your, if you have that mentor uh, relationship, you can go to that person and say, hey, I need to tell you something. And then you know that one person that you're talking to, you can trust that information with. And now it's not 120 women at a, at a conference. So number two, ask permission before sharing someone else's truth, especially your spouse's. So here I am up here talking about marriage, and sometimes I'm using things from my own marriage. I can assure you that uh, most of the things I talk about or that I have not said that you don't know, I have already asked my spouse, is it okay if I said this? And a lot of times she's like, no, it's not. Okay, I won't say that then. So it's really important that um, you are honoring that for your spouse and not embarrassing the living crap out of them in public by saying something that may very well be true, but then ends up damaging them because of it. So it's important that you ask permission before sharing someone else's truth. So number three, ask God to examine your motives. And it goes right back to chapter four. What's the purpose of you telling this truth? Is it necessary? Is it going to be wholesome telling this truth? How much of this truth do you tell? Okay, so it's really important that you are cautious about the motives behind telling the truth. It's very easy to use a truth to hurt somebody. It's very true, and you tell them that, and then it's just hurtful. So um, I have this note written, and I wrote so small, I almost can't read it. Let's see here. So you may be telling the truth, but if your motive is for any purpose other than honoring the Lord, it is the exact same as dishonest behavior. Now, when I read that the first time, I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. Like, is that really dishonest to, to tell someone a truth but not doing it to honor God? But if you stop and think about that, it goes right back to the purpose, the motive behind it. So um, if you go into the worldly side of things, you see it in TV all the time, right, where one spouse will uh, cheat, and then the other spouse will do what back? They'll cheat too. And then they'll, they'll make it known that they did it. They'll record it or some terrible thing. They'll put it on media. I don't know how they do it, but it's just terrible stuff. And... Um, and, that's, uh, and they're telling the truth, right? They did it. <laughs> but that's obviously not a way to honor the Lord and that truth, right? To just give it to a, the spouse with how you, you wronged them back. So you can see how that would be dishonest, a dishonest way of dealing with it. And then finally, make sure the truth you are about to share is necessary to disclose. So this is the one that can be incredibly tricky and also... Um, a sinful out. So someone said, well, okay, so I cheated on my spouse like four years ago. She never found out. And um, that's not necessary for her to know, right? And so you, you think, well, if I, if I tell her, I mean, I'm past that. She, you know, I'm not going to do that ever again. And I know she trusts me now, and it's fine. She doesn't know about it. There's no reason to tell her. And, and, you're, and you're reasoning in your mind sinfully as to why you don't need to disclose that. So we go back to that important piece of, is this thing that you need to disclose, is doing so going to honor God more than not doing so? And that's the thing you're going to have to ask yourself, pray over, ask that support partner about. So I have um, from page 129. <clears throat> Come on. So this is really short text here. Telling your spouse that you had to repent to the Lord for looking twice at an attractive person while stopping or shopping may be true, but it may not be necessary. Even if you honestly wish your spouse would get laser treatment for aging skin, a new hair color, tooth whitening, or a new style of clothing, telling him or her just might do more harm than good. Also, describing in detail 
uh, an affair that you just had, just so you can be completely honest, especially if your spouse hasn't asked, might be more information that is necessary and will actually hinder the healing process. So before disclosing anything, be sure to also ask God about the way in which the information should be disclosed. Good communication skills, word choice, listening skills, and body language are of the utmost importance. And then there's this little line of that. Another factor to consider is that some spouses can handle more truth and more detail than others. So you might have a friend that says, well, this is what I did with my spouse, and it worked wonderfully. And, and they just spilled the beans, right? Whereas your spouse is like, I just need to know the basics and then just stop. And so you just, you just need to know your spouse. So it goes right back to chapter 5. How well do you know your spouse? And hopefully really well. And if you do know them really well, you'll know that answer already, that they need a lot of detail or very little. And the easiest way to know if they need a lot is they'll ask. You'll tell the truth, and they'll be like, well, what happened? Okay, that's your cue. Tell them more, right? So, um, but don't just share every last little detail until you know for sure that's going to be honoring to God and something that your spouse is going to be able to handle. And then finally, to tell or not to tell. So the answer here is very simple, and the process is incredibly complicated. But first, you should never lie to your spouse. That's just a given. Never, ever, not even white lies, lie to your spouse. Next, you need to ask God to reveal to you if and when you should reveal the situation to your spouse. So then there's this list of things, and I'm not going to go through every one because we're running out of time. There's this list of things, of questions you should ask yourself. Um, like, has your spouse ever asked point blank about a particular sin? And, and on the list, down the list it goes. If you were to answer yes to a single one of those questions, you definitely need to disclose that information to your spouse. Um, and if, even if they're all no, and you're still like, eh, I don't know, maybe I should, that's where you pray. And then give it some more prayer if you haven't gotten the answer. And um, if you're still unsure, you need to find that trustworthy person in your life that you can bring the situation to and give it up to God with so that you both can work together on how to deal with it. Um, Truth can be a painful thing, especially when the truth you're sharing is guaranteed to hurt the person. So like, there's a TV show I just watched um, last week where uh, a father had died, and the daughter didn't know yet. And so the uncle, which is the brother to the father, was asking the cop, how do you tell uh, your niece that their dad is dead? Now, there's a few options. You can hide it for a while, right, until you deal with it. And they're like, where's my dad? Where's my dad? Oh, he's working. He's working and now you're lying about it. And so there's these times where that truth that you're going to tell is going to be painful. It's going to cause some hurt. And um, the reality is you still have to tell it. You can't hide that truth. Um, but there's a way to do it. So those, that's a short list of uh, strategies and how you go about, um, and that delicate dance piece, of how you go about telling that truth and being tasteful and God-honoring as you do so. Um, now, if, if you're like Michelle, where you had to disclose an adulterous situation, um, that's where you're definitely going to want some counsel on how and when to do that and just really trust the Lord to bring that to light. Um, and, or maybe the thing is smaller than that. Um, and typically it will be. And that's where the danger, I think, really lies. The big lies we know we need to say. It's the small ones we're like, do we really need to say? And that's where you just pray about it. And God will convict your heart on those situations and bring that to light. And if, he, if you don't bring it to light, then I assure you, through the actions and the courses of those natural consequences, it will be. So just think about that. So, and then the, the chapter finishes with, even if your spouse refuses to take the risk to be open and honest with you, you can always still do your part with them. So in chapter uh, 9, is it, the whole chapter is about how do you make changes with an unwilling spouse? And that's what this question is really about. If your spouse isn't willing to be honest with you, does that mean you're allowed to be dishonest with them too? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the only way your spouse will ever turn tail and go the opposite direction to be honest is if you start by being honest. You know, and it goes back to chapter 5. Maybe your spouse's love tank is empty, and you need to fill it back up. They need to feel that love from you, that see that example of Christ's merciful grace and love coming from you to help them realize they need to be better too. So be that Christ-like person to your spouse. Be honest and loving and merciful and find those moments where you can be honest to them, um, even if that's painful. Never let those things sit. 
because um, they're going to eat your marriage apart. And it always starts slow and soft, and you think, oh, it's not a big deal. And then it just eats and eats and eats until years pass, and there's lots of emotional drama. All right, so so the final verse, and then we can pray you out. Keep your heart with all vigilance, vigilance, sorry, for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. And that's from Proverbs 4. Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for the willingness of all the people gathered here to spend time with us and learning about our marriage and about how important it is to be God-honoring and honest with each other. So I pray, Lord, that you just work on our, each and every one of our hearts and help us to find ways to just share that, that honest truth with our spouse about how wonderful you are and to, to be examples of you to each other and just to love each other well. And as we go throughout this week, that you give us those opportunities to, to share any uh, truths that we need to share and have the right ways and the right times to do so. And I just thank you again for uh, everybody that is here and has blessed their weeks. In your name I pray, amen. So next week is chapter 8. Please make sure you read it. If you're behind, just read chapter 8 and then try to catch up later. Chapter 8 is another big one, another hard one.